Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Astronomy 102 Festivities of Stars, okay, uh, of the Moon, actually. So today we're going to be learning a little bit about how the Moon plays a very important role in the calendar system of a human being and of our cultures as well. And it kind of still plays a very important role in the many different cultures on Earth as well. So right now, uh, I'm also going to introduce you to some of the free uh, planetarium software that we'll be using, okay? Now, the first one we'll be using is something called the World Wide Telescope. So anyway, here is uh, Yong over here, and uh, I'll be bringing you over here to the World Wide Telescope right now. And if you can see, right, uh, right now it seems like a very complicated program, but down below you can see a few uh, interesting things. I just click on Earth, and they slowly move us slowly down towards our sun and towards our planet Earth as well. Oh, very nice, okay? Now you can see, right, this is our, our blue planet, okay? Very beautiful. The, the only planet in our solar system that's able, capable of supporting light. And if I zoom out, you can see that half above is shrouded in shadows, okay? The night side. And uh, orbiting around Earth over here, we have, what's that? Now, if it looks too small to you, right, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger, okay, now. Obviously, that's the natural satellite of Earth, which is called Moon. As some like to call it Selene or Luna. Now, of course, like, how long do you think it takes for the Moon to make one complete orbit around Earth? Well, it's roughly around 27.3 days, okay? Now, as it moves around Earth right, in this orbit, uh, the interplay between the light from the Sun and uh, Earth and our position naturally causes uh, the appearance of the Moon, right? The, the, you know, kind of change actually to produce what is called the phase of the moon, okay? So yeah, it's very nice. So it sometimes it looks like a crescent, sometimes like a giant ball, okay? And sometimes it disappears altogether. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to speed time up around 300, uh, 100,000, okay, times. And I would like you to see how the, oops, 10,000, 100,000, oops, you can see, right, uh, the moon is going around Earth. And at the same time, right, Earth is also going around the sun. How long do you think it takes for Earth to go around the sun? One complete circle. Well, it takes one year, okay? Now, in our calendar, we call it one sidereal year. 365 days and uh, one quarter, of course. So that is one year, and our present calendar system that we have nowadays makes use of this uh, solar calendar, okay? The way Earth goes around the sun, yeah. But do you know that there are some cultures on Earth that actually use the moon. And in fact, most of us actually use the concept of the moon going around Earth or one moon for a month as a form of basis for measurements as well. So that is why we still call it one month, okay? All right, so that is the Worldwide Telescope, okay? So next, right, we're probably going to switch over to our one of our favorite uh, software we'll be using. It is called Stellarium, okay? So just wait a little while before we switch over to Stellarium. All right, so here we go. Let's switch over to Stellarium right now. All right, so you can see, right, this is the sky as it looks like in Stellarium, and you can see it's very easy to navigate there. So we're looking at the southern part of the sky over here. That's the southeast, and of course, we have Jupiter and Saturn somewhere in the eastern part of the sky. Now, I'm also going to look for the moon. Okay, let's see if the moon is visible tonight. It, sh it should be visible. Ah, there it is. Let's zoom out slightly. It's a little bit higher up, so I'm going to kind of a center over here, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer. Now, the moon right uh, from Stellarium looks a little bit different, isn't it? So the thing is, if you look at the shape of the moon, it's almost three-quarter full, right? Now, we tend to call this the gibbous moon. So right now, I'm going to advance time forward so that it's a little bit later in the evening, probably around 9. Ah, when it gets darker, the moon looks better. Now, I always remember the moon doesn't really produce light of itself. It is, in fact, reflecting the light from the sun. Now, of course, like right now, it is the 30th of July. So what's going to happen next? I'm going to speed up by one day. I want you to observe what happens to the moon. Do you think it will change? Oops, it changed, okay. Did it become bigger or smaller? Let's increase it again. Oh, it's actually becoming bigger. It's really fuller. Now, this is what we call a waxing uh, waxing moon, okay? So this is a waxing gibbous moon. So waxing means it's actually becoming bigger and bigger. And right now, it's becoming a full moon. And right now, it's becoming smaller. So when it tends to become smaller, we call it a waning gibbous moon right now. 
And right now, this is a waning uh, half moon. And of course, the crescent moon. And once again, oh, now this is a new one. This is when, uh, you know, this is what we call a new moon. Okay, now, many different cultures on Earth tend to use uh, from new moons to crescent moon, to half moon, to full moon, all the way back towards a new moon again as a form of measurement of a month, which is roughly around 29 to 30 days. So right now, this is the new moon over here. And of course, if I advance time forward once again, it will go back once again. So in a way, right, a regular cycle okay, that allows human beings to keep a record okay, of uh, when something is going to happen next. All right, so it's pretty cool. Now, the thing is, in Singapore, are there any people that actually use the moon as a form of measurement? Of course, uh, there are still plenty, actually. For example, uh, the Chinese, they tend to use a combination of a lunar calendar and a solar calendar. Lunar to keep track of the months, and of course, a solar calendar to keep track of a year. Okay, So uh, a combination of this is called a lunisolar cycle, which is a very complicated word, isn't it? All right, now, of course, the one clear way to see uh, how people use a calendar is to look at some of their festivities, okay? In uh, Chinese, right, what's the most important uh, festival? It's probably a Lunar New Year, isn't it? Now, the clue, Lunar, tells us that it's something to do with the moon, okay? Now, here's how they actually uh, calculate or, or measure the Lunar New Year. As you know, it happens uh, not on the same day every year, isn't it? So, firstly, uh, they use a solar calendar to keep track. So, uh, they use a solar calendar to look for this day called the uh, winter solstice. Now, this, uh, this year, right, when, did, when do you think the winter solstice happens? Obviously, winter will be a 12, isn't it? Somewhere in December when it gets super cold. And it happens on the 21st of December. Same time, every, uh, well, same date every year, okay? It is the time when the northern part of the world is tilted away from the sun. Theoretically, right, it is the day with the shortest day and the longest night, okay? The depth of winter, the coldest time of the year. So it happens every same same date every year, okay? So that is obviously very, uh, how is it, predictable. The next part is not so predictable, okay? The next part is, uh, when will Lunar New Year fall after the winter solstice? Well, firstly, uh, after the winter solstice, right, there will be two new moons. Not one, but two new moons. And on the second new moon, right, that is when the Lunar New Year will occur. So uh, right now, here is about half moon over here. So uh, let me speed uh, date forward over here. So right now it's the 21st of December. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, 21, 22. Oh, I guess this will be a lunar. Oh, this is a new moon. This is the first new moon, not the first, the second, okay? So let's wait, go for the next one. <laughs> Okay, it's going to happen soon, okay? Oh, waning crescent moon, almost new. All right, so right now, I believe, right, it's roughly around the 12th or to 13th of uh, February, okay? That would define the next Lunar New Year. So why isn't it clear when is the Lunar New Year? Because uh, this kind of estimation, right, is subject to human interpretation. Some people say, no, that doesn't look like a new moon. Perhaps it's not dark enough. So there are human opinions in such matter as well. Now, of course, our Lunar New Year is uh, celebrated as the coming of spring, okay? After the horrors of, well, the starvation of winter, and when you finish all your stores of food, spring is the best time, okay, to celebrate something. So I, there are always reasons why people celebrate festivals, isn't it? Uh, holidays and things like that. It's usually to, you know, celebrate, you know, overcoming something not so nice like a winter, or perhaps right, it is when you tend to harvest your crops, okay? Sometimes in, uh, well, in in autumn, in, in October, November period as well. All right, so yeah. Okay, so that's the Lunar New Year. It's also celebrated by in, by in Vietnam as well and in many different cultures, okay? So the thing is, that's uh, Lunar New Year. What other cultures actually use uh, the moon as a form of calendar? Well, there is also the Indians, okay, or the Hindus, that they also use a combination of the sun, the solar calendar, and of course, the lunar calendar as months as well. Now, for, for these two cultures, right, the Indian and Chinese, right, so what happens if there's extra day in a year? Because, you know, you tend to use, a, if you just use a moon, you left you only 354 days in a year. 
So what? How do they account for those extra days? Okay. So over time, right, they evolve a complicated system of padding out a, perhaps an extra months or like thirteen months in a year or some extra days as well. So that is, uh, of course, the Chinese and the Indians as well. So the thing is, right? What is the most important or one of the more important festivals for for the Indians? Now in Singapore, it would probably be Deepavali, isn't it? Now, when is Deepavali celebrated? If you think about it, is it celebrated early in the year, mid year? Now, close towards the end of the year, isn't it? Somewhere between the uh, mid October and mid November. All right. So uh, let's go towards a uh, mid October right now. So back towards the year two zero two zero, and back towards October. Okay. Ah, and let's uh, mid October. Now, right now, it is uh, mid-October right now, and you can see it's pretty kind of a crescent moon, okay? I believe, right, in between 15th of October and uh, 15th of November, there is going to be one, how to say, a new moon, okay? And on that new moon will be celebrated the day of Deepavali. And obviously, right, Deepavali is celebrated uh, to celebrate the overcoming of good over evil, of uh, light over darkness, of knowledge over ignorance. And it's not just celebrated by Hindus in India, but also by Sikhs and Jains as well. So like a Lunar New Year, right, it's not just celebrated in one single country, but all over the world by many different peoples. All right, so new moon, okay? Remember, the, in the Chinese and the Indian, they tend to use the new moon to new moon as a measurement of month. So uh, new moon is the new part of a month. So here we go. 15, 16, not this one, 17, 18, 19, 20, okay, let's move on. Oh. All right, I believe it's going to come soon. Woo. And that's it. Probably around 14 to 15 of November will be celebrated the day of Deepavali. Now, like I say, right, this kind of things uh, has got human intervention as well. And of course, uh, how do people celebrate Deepavali? By lighting up a lot of a light, right? Lem lamps, lanterns, and candles, okay, is, is a festival of light as well. So when is the best time to actually celebrate that? Well, of course, when the, when the, when the night is as dark as it can, isn't it? And of course, during uh, October and November, right, this is the time when you tend to harvest a crop. So it's a plentiful of crops and you tend to eat very well during those times as well. So there's always a rational, a reason why people celebrate their festivals uh, at certain times of the year. All right, so that's uh, Deepavali or Diwali in India. Now, let's talk about the third major culture in Singapore. That's probably the Malays or the Muslims in Singapore, okay? And one of the very important festivals they celebrate is Hari Raya Puasa, isn't it? And of course, uh, we have a uh, Haji uh, to, well, tomorrow as well. So uh, what is Hari Raya Puasa? Well, it's celebrated usually, uh, well, this year, right, it happens on the 24th. Of May, okay, so 24th of May, and it's usually it's well it's celebrated during a crescent moon, okay, a teen crescent moon, not a new moon, but a teen crescent moon. Yeah, so let's have a look at the pizza. Oh, if you see, oh, if you look over there, there's this tiny little crescent of light over here. So that's uh that's that's the crescent moon that they usually celebrate Hari Raya Puasa on, and it's of course it happens at the end of the month of Ramadan as well. Now, unlike the Chinese and the Indians, right, the, the Muslims, they, they tend to use only the lunar calendar as a cycle. So they don't make use of the sun as a form of measure. Well, not, of course, as day as well, but they don't use it as a continuous measurement of their dates, okay? So that means, right, their festivals, their Hari Raya Posa can actually fall on every month of the year. For example, it can happen on the January, it can happen on uh, December and any of the months, actually. And of course, like, throughout, uh, if you have given enough time, right, it will happen all the time on every month as well. And in fact, in some years, right, you can even have a Hari Raya Posa on two of them happening in one year, which I believe there is in the year 2000 as well. All right, so you know what? Uh, let's have a look at the Hari Raya Posa. Okay, so uh, let's go towards 24th of May. The first Hari Raya, well, the Hari Raya Posa that falls this year. All right, 24th of May over here. Ah, as you can see, there's a thin little crescent of light, okay, that defines uh, when it is going to be celebrated. 
Now you have to remember, okay, it has to be celebrated by this akin little crescent. Observe, okay. Now, how can we predict Hari Raya Puasa? Well, because uh, like I say, right, uh, the Muslims they tend to use a lunar calendar. That means that it's and they don't tend to add extra days to to pad out the the years. Okay, so that means right, Hari Raya Puasa, the subsequent one, the next one will happen roughly around eleven days. Well, earlier, okay. So this is, uh, of course, in 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 uh, this year, two thousand, doing two zero two zero. How about two zero two one? Well, it should happen eleven days earlier. So, uh, twenty fourth one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So this is the next year in two zero two one, and of course in two zero two two, eleven days earlier as well. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. 11, okay, so again, once again, it is a crescent moon. All right, so from here, right, I know it can be a little bit complicated, the, the techniques of it, but uh, to make it easier for us to understand, okay, I'm going to switch over to a, to a slide so it can kind of reiterate uh, and summarize some of these festivities as well. So I'm just going to close this over here and move over to the slide. All right, now we should be moving on to this slide over here called the phases of the moon. Now, this is just to make it easier for you to kind of understand what's happening. So this, of course, is the crescent moon. As it becomes bigger, it means to wax, okay, to become bigger. And full moon, and once again, to be a crescent moon. And of course, the duration from one to the other, to the last one, is roughly around 29 to 30 days. Now, some culture use a crescent moon as the beginning of months, like the Muslims. Others, like the Indians and Chinese, they tend to use a new moon, okay, to from a new moon to new moon, all right? So it's 29 to 30 days as well. Of course, let's have a look at the lunar new year. Occurs two new moons after the winter solstice that falls on the 21st of December. So by the way, this uh, nice image, that's the sunlight and the tilt of the north away from the sun. Now, of course, uh, this will be the northern parts of the world be experiencing winter well. The south, <laughs> exposed to a greater amount of sunlight, is experiencing summer. Oh, by the way, uh, winter solstice is all called Dongzi, and uh, Chinese, right, we celebrate it by eating the glutinous rice balls. And not one new moon, but two new moons, okay? That's the that's, uh, Lunar New Year. All right, so, uh, yeah, how about Deepavali? Of course, uh, between uh, mid-October and mid-November. And... Uh, so I'm just going to add the 15th of October and 15th of November. And in between, right, there should be a new moon. And on that new moon, will be celebrated the day of Deepavali. And Hari Raya Posa, well, celebrated after the months of Ramadan, the fasting month. And you have to remember, okay, after such a long fasting, right, you really want to celebrate by eating good food as well. And uh, it happens during a crescent moon. So each subsequent Hari Raya Posa will fall 11 days earlier. So that is a one technique. Lah. So for example, here we have a 26th of June, okay, for 2017 and 2018, 11 days earlier, 11 days earlier. Now this year, right, uh, you can see, observe on the 25th of May as well. Like I've said, right, it's due to human uh, observation and invention as well. So that is, uh, yeah. And of course, in 2021, it will happen on 13th of May as well. All right, so that is a little bit of a, you know, yeah, update and summarization. Now, the next part, right, is uh, if anybody has any questions, right, please try to click on the link uh, on the YouTube or on the Facebook channel and try to ask any of your questions, okay? And if you have any comment, just put it on the Facebook comments and we'll try to go back to it if we can as well, all right? So from here, right, I think it is time for me to try to uh, look through some of the questions uh, that some of you may have, and let's have a look, okay? So I'm going to check the questions. All right, so I think we do have a few questions as well. So why do the seas move with the tidal waves? Well, that's a very, very good question, okay? That's uh, from Titus, by the way, all right, good question. So the thing is, right, the, the moon has mass, doesn't it? And of course, anything that's got mass will exert gravity as well, okay? So of course, when the moon moves over Earth, you know, at certain parts of the ocean, right, it actually draws the sea upwards, sort of like a tiny little bulge, okay? 
So these vouchers, of course, we call it high tide. Now, on the other side, because the water tends to move upward, uh, move towards the moon, right? It kind of uh, becomes low tide over there. And as it moves, right, it influences the tidal forces. And these will cause sometimes right, spectacular effects of movement of waves, okay? And of course, uh, some people even believe this, uh, this forces is enough to actually cause earthquake. I don't really think it will be enough to, to cause earthquake, but uh, that's, that's a very, very interesting question. All right, now we also have another question. Can we see the American flag on the moon? Well, uh, well, theoretically, if you are on the moon, you should be able to see it. But of course, from Earth, there is no telescope capable of actually trying to peer at the moon as well. But one thing, right, I've heard that uh, because of the exposure to sunlight, from you know the constant exposure to sunlight, uh, the the colors on the flag, right, will probably be washed out and kind of uh, burned out as well. Okay, because uh, you know it tends to discolor over time. All right, so. Uh, Thank you very much, okay, for the question. So if you'd like to write, keep the questions coming and if you have any, any comments, just uh, just put it on the Facebook page, okay, and we might want to, we will probably go back to it later as well. All right, so with that, right, let us move on to our next part, which is about the formation of the moon. How was the moon actually formed? All right, so from here, right, I hope to show you a small little video that shows you how the moon may possibly be formed as well. All right, so over here, we have this uh, video. This, by the way, is from a uh, European Southern Observatory. And we can show them to you by, if I can, if you have to show it in full, okay? So uh, do check them out as well. They're very interesting resources. Now, you can see, right, it looks like the moon right, was formed roughly around 4.5 billion years ago when uh, Earth itself was struck by a very large uh, planetary body called Theia. Now, all this debris of the Theia and Earth was thrown out into space orbiting around Earth, right, has a form of rings. And over time, right, they tend to coalesce, condense to form itself into a moon roundish shape, okay? So it took probably a millions of years to form our moon, okay? And that doesn't just happen because through the billions of years later, right, it has been struck many times by an asteroid, by comets, and probably most of it during this uh, period called the late bombardment period. That's about 3 billion years ago when there's still a lot of asteroids and things out there. And you can see the impact was so huge and powerful, it causes the surface of the moon to melt, okay? Lakes of liquid lava that cools down, okay? And over time, to form this a smoother, you know, glassy shape or surface on the moon itself. You can see, right, it's a little bit darker. So ancient astronomers, when they use a telescope in the early parts to look at the moon, and they see all this smoothen, parts on the moon and say, hey, what's all those things? Are these seas or oceans on the moon? So they call them Marias, okay? So uh, yeah, seas on the moon. Indeed, okay, that is of course a very interesting. All right, now our next part, right? After we have seen this beautiful uh, formation of the moon, we are going to move on next to our, our different software. Now this one is called, uh, well, Google Earth. <laughs> and you might be curious, like, oh, Google Earth? Well, the thing is, Google actually does have the image, uh, the shape, and the geography of the moon as well. So right now, we are looking at the moon. And uh, if you have Google Earth Pro, which you can download for free, and you see this little button up here, right, that shows shoot switch between Earth, sky, and other planets, you can actually also look at the moon. And it is a very, very high-quality moon as well. All right. So uh, the thing is, remember all these darkened areas on the moon? What are they? Well, they were the, the lava that's cooled down, isn't it? That people tend to call the sea. Now, if you look right over here, right? Long time ago, people think that there used to be a shape that looks like a man on the moon. Can you see that? A man on the moon. Human beings tend to recognize, you know, to identify curious patterns, okay? In uh, un, you know, random complex uh, shapes over here. So from here, I can see an eyeball. Can you see that? This is the left small eyeball. And this is the big eyeball. So this is like a person with a big small eye over there. Here is the nose. Can you see the nose? That's the nostril over here. And there's a small little mouth somewhere right over here. Can you see that? Yeah. Now this is the part of the moon that we always tend to see, isn't it? So right now I'm going to show you how to identify some of the areas on the moon. So let's have a look at the small little eyeball over here. All right. Now this one is called the Sea of Serenity. Okay. So it's called Maria Serenitatis, or the Sea of uh, Serenity. Quite nice, right? 
And you can see it's a little bit darker and it's much smoother than the other parts over here. And of course, the big eyeball was the big eyeball. This one is called the Sea of Imbrium, Maris Imbrium. By the way, Imbrium actually means shower or rain over here. And you might notice there's this strip of a much more defined uh, area, part of the moon. So there, there is an orbiter, uh, kind of like a satellite that orbits around, the artificial one that sets up the orbits around the moon. And it takes high quality images over here as well. So remember the two eyeballs, the Sea of Serenity, the small eyeball, the big one, the Sea of Imbrium, okay? And down over here, somewhere over here, ah, below the Sea of Imbrium, there's these nice little crater. Can you see that? Now, this one is a very favorite of mine, actually. It's called Copernicus. And you can see it's a very powerful impact. So powerful that you can see the blast pattern over here, isn't it? Yeah, that's Copernicus crater. So that one should be easy to spot for later. Let's see if we can look at the moon, the real moon, and try to spot for Copernicus over here. So remember, that is on the underneath the right eye, so you might think of it as a mole over there. Over there. And on this other cheek over here, oh, what is this? So we have got the Copernicus underneath the right eyeball. Underneath uh, the left small, uh, left small eyeball, we have another C, okay? Now this one is called the C of Tranquility, okay? And the C of Tranquility is a very interesting place because human beings have actually, uh, how to say, well, landed here, somewhere over here first. Oh, there it is. This is the first place where they kind of landed on. Yeah, there is a Apollo 11 mission over here. Can you see that? Pretty cool, huh? You can kind of try to land on it a little bit. Whoa! Oh, most pressure, no! Oh. Down over here, you can, well, theoretically kind of have a look. Okay, so this is just an image over here. I'm going to zoom out a little bit over here. All right, so we have the Sea of Tranquility. Okay, very nice. And you can see there's a lot of craters over there. Now, where is the next area? Ah, there's one area which is also very easy to identify. Now, you might say, oh, like so many craters, it's hard to identify them. Now, don't worry, I'm just trying to identify the biggest and easiest to spot for. Now, down over here, what we will tend to think of as the southern part of the moon, we have another crater. Now, this one is called Tycho. Tycho Brahe, I guess you would say. So, this is a very nice crater because it's a uh, much more, how to say, paler than the rest, okay? And there's this raised little bits over here. So whenever we have a powerful asteroid impact or a crater form, right, it causes an effect known as liquefaction. Uh, when the rocks, right, starts to melt and, you know, under the great force, right, it tends to pull and cause a raised little mountain in the center of a crater. So that tells us of a very powerful impact as well. All right, so with that, right, we have a look at some of those interesting areas on the moon, okay, and do try to spot up for those areas as well. Okay, now from here, right, I'm, I want to show you a little bit of a, a guided tour of, of, of the Apollo 11 mission. So here we go. Let's have a... I'm Andrew Chaikin, author of A Man on the Moon, The Voyages of the Apollo Astronauts. By July 1969, NASA was racing to meet President Kennedy's audacious 1961 challenge to land a man on the moon and return him safely to the Earth by the end of the decade. Apollo 11 might just be the mission that transformed the moon from a light in the sky into a place where humans had actually walked. For its history-making crew, Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Mike Collins, and Lunar Module Pilot Buzz Aldrin, this was the ultimate test flight. But by far, the most complex and difficult part was the lunar landing itself. Armstrong had privately concluded that they had about a 90% chance of getting home safely, but only a 50% chance of a successful landing. And there it is where they landed as well. So the vehicle that you saw just now, that was uh, what we call uh, the Lunar Excursion Module, okay? So, uh, oops. And we are going to kind of like pan around as well. Just like a Google Earth, you can kind of have a look as well, okay? So that, by the way, is a Lunar Excursion Module. At that time, was uh, nicknamed the, the, how to say, the Eagle, okay? And now, of course, uh, they managed to land them on the moon. And of course, you returned them back all the way towards Earth once again. 
All right, now before right, we end off with uh, the Google Moon, right? Why don't I show you one thing as well, the real moon, okay? Now, I'm sure you, all of you are very curious to have a look at how the real moon would really look like, isn't it? So uh, one of our colleagues, right, has actually captured the live feed of the moon as well and place it on YouTube, okay? So from here, right, I'm going to move towards the YouTube live feed and let's see if we can spot some of those areas that we talk about on the real moon. So here we go, moving on towards the real moon. All right, so, oh, there you go. Quite nice, okay? Now, this, of course, is a, it's a little bit different, okay? But this is real. Now, remember, this is the big eyeball. Do you remember that? What is the big eyeball called? It's the Sea of Imbrium, okay? And, of course, uh, the small eyeball over here, the Sea of Serenity. And this part over here, this is the Sea of Tranquility, okay? And that's usually where we think of the nose as well. The nose is somewhere down over here. And what is this small little crater? Well, not small, quite a large crater over here, just below the big right eyeball. Now that is the, well, the Copernicus uh, crater as well, isn't it? Now the thing is, right, the moon is as beautiful as it is, and it provides us with a regular cycle of keeping our calendar. Our months that we use is, of course, derived from the changing phase of the moon during 9 to 30 days. And of course, uh, it is not just human beings that use the cycle of the moon. Many animals on Earth use the, the phase of the moon in the, as a way of mating, as navigation, and all kinds of important things as well. The moon going around Earth, right, tends to influence the tidal forces on Earth, and that also causes a great effect on many life on Earth. The turtles that crawls, you know, from the, from the sand, they're returning back to the sea, right? They also require the moon in a way as a form of navigation. So the moon plays a very important role for us. Now, before we end, right, uh, I have one last thing to show you. I want to show a little bit of video, actually, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So from this uh, feed over here, I'm going to move on towards the next uh, video as well. Now, this one, right, shows a little a keystone species, okay, that tends to use uh, the, the phases of the moon, specifically the full moon, as a way of spawning. So here we go. Corals are a beautiful and important part of our ocean, but they can't move around the ocean floor. So how exactly do they find mates? Reef-building corals, also known as stony or hard corals, reproduce in several ways, one of the most common of which is broadcast spawning. This bizarre and beautiful phenomenon starts when male and female corals release reproductive cells called gametes into the water. Coral reefs may be separated by wide distances, so this tactic enables gametes to mix genetics and spread their offspring over a broad geographic area. Male and female gametes combine together and form a baby coral called a planula. Planulae float in the water for days or weeks until they find a hard surface to which they can attach. Along many reefs, coral spawning occurs as a synchronized event when many coral species release their gametes around the same time. With all the corals on a reef releasing gametes at the same time, there's a better chance of escaping hungry predators and a greater possibility that many different genetic combinations may form. More genetic diversity means there's a better chance that at least some of the new corals have gene combinations that will help them survive extreme temperatures or diseases. And with rising ocean temperatures and increasing acidification, it's important for corals to be as resilient as possible. All right, that's a little bit of coral spawning. Okay, synchronize their spawning to coincide to gather each other during some time during the full moon. So human beings have been trying to uh, simulate that, of course, uh, some with a limited success as well. So remember, it's not just human beings that uses the cycle of the moon to do things, okay? And so that's right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I hope you enjoy uh, a little bit of our vodcast, okay? And so before we end, I'm going to end off with this. Stay safe. Stay curious and keep looking up. All right, so uh, hang on a while, okay? I have a news, okay, from our observatory over here. There is, seems, right, there is a good sky tonight, perhaps. Uh, then Jupiter is visible in the sky, okay? So we'll put a live of uh, whatever we can as well of Jupiter, if you would like to look at that. By the way, right, if you don't know already, Jupiter has got multiple moons orbiting around it. So Earth is not the only planet or moon. Jupiter has uh, over 60 moons, okay? But uh, probably using a telescope, you might see about four at most.
All right, just stay on. All right. All right, so uh, once again, okay, a very goodbye over here and uh, stay, well, stay safe and stay curious and keep looking up once again.